I'd like you to welcome Mike Daniels, who's the chair of AMEC, of course, and also a senior consultant at Report International, another stalwart of our industry. And Mike has done a huge amount of work on um, updating the valid metrics framework for social media uh, to make it relevant, and he's going to uh, tell us how he's got on with there, and we're going to see a, a little case study as well. Thank you, Richard. Um, I'm going to start by saying I feel exactly like I used to feel when I used to deliver client presentations with lots of data, and clients would always, you know, at regional global meetings, they'd say, ah, research, we're going to put that on after lunch on the last day. <laughs> and everybody's going, oh, no, no, and it's numbers, and PR people go, oh, no, no. so I, I feel a little bit like that, and I hope I can keep some energy going. Um, and I also promise not to be as long-winded as I usually am. Um, I want to, uh, to talk about the, um, where's the clicker? I want to talk about the valid metrics frameworks. I want to come back to a little bit about why we developed them in the first place. So you may recall that the Barcelona principles uh, set us out on a sort of framework um, for developing uh, a way in which uh, end user clients, in a sense, and, and, and us as intermediaries to those end user clients, could link activity through to intermediary effects. To, to real outcomes and real actions. So it gave a client an opportunity to link the metrics both back to their activities and through to, to their outcomes. Um, what I'm going to propose to show you here is, is um, and, and Richard and I have had a debate about the, whether we number this as uh, 1.0 or point zero point 0.1. I think of it as 0 0.1. Richard has greater ambition and wants it to be 1.0. But the basic point is that this is only a draft. It's a, a, a straw man, if you like. And what I want to stress is that we need to make this process as collaborative as possible. So the framework was derived from the original Barcelona principles. Um, the idea was that it would set and enable a client or an agency to help uh, their clients set goals and metrics. Um, it was focused on outcomes being the most single most important um, element of a, of a measurement program. It wasn't the data for its own sake. Um, it was designed to be a very practical tool, and I'm, I'm very keen on stressing the pragmatic nature of this work. We are, as an association, we're not a research body. We are a trade association. We do practical work every day for our clients. So what we wanted to do was to build a framework that would enable us to advance the practice of what we do, not necessarily the based on good research, but not to, uh, to be hung up on methodology so much. Um, it was uh, designed to set expectations and targets because clients clearly uh, over-expect and, and we sometimes under-deliver against those expectations. And this was a way in which we could frame those expectations uh, accurately. Um, it was based around something very familiar to end-user clients. Uh, you may argue that the sales funnel approach that we used, if you remember, I'll show you how that works in a second, uh, for those who haven't seen the framework, but you may argue that's an inappropriate set of headings, but actually it meant that clients could really relate directly to um, the stages of, the, of, of their programs and the metrics that were suitable to identify success or performance against each of the stages of the, of the funnel. And crucially, it, it went from activity through intermediary effects to, to outcomes. Now, the interesting thing, of course, is social media, as in fact part of the conversation with, uh, with Don we just had, poses some very interesting challenges to that model, and those are the challenges that we need to address and reflect in version going forward of the, um, of the new framework. So we may need a new grid. We may need to modify the existing grid. We don't know yet, but what we want to do is to get your input uh, over the next few weeks or months to ensure that we arrive at a model that's robust, flexible, and scalable. So the relevant... Uh, Barcelona principles, um, there are four of them. Goal setting and measurement, critical. We said that social media can and should be measured, and I think part of what we've all been working at today is, is implementing that Barcelona principle in a way. Um, number five was measuring outcomes as preferred to measuring media results, and of course that's an interesting challenge within the social media space because we've actually talked about the fact that it's not about media anymore. So that's an interesting one. Uh, but number seven, which is a particular uh, passion of mine, which is that we ought to be transparent and, re and be able to repeat our research work to our clients to ensure that we are being as accurate and rigorous as possible. So in specifics, in goal setting, um, what is different in a sense is that goal setting in social media is now going to be uh, multi-layered. There are lots of different applications that, that, that derive from single activities if indeed you are taking activities forward. It's dynamic, it changes over time, and sometimes you're not in control of those changes. 
So we have to be able to reflect how changes in the social media ecosphere itself impact upon uh, some of the, the performance measures that you're tracking. It's both reactive and proactive. You have to make sure that you're identifying conversations that do self-ignite in the, in the ecosphere and are able to build those into, into your model in some way. Outcomes should always be the goal. Um, what I think is interesting is that we don't own the conversation anymore. We've talked about that a lot. It's all about uh, dialogue. It's all about input from your consumers or from your audiences as much as you trying to tell people something. It's, no, it's not broadcast anymore, in other words. The interesting thing is the outcomes, and, and this actually kind of feeds into what Don was saying, um, is it's quite difficult now to track outcomes sometimes. Advocacy and recommendations are one thing, but they could be very distant, actually. But they could also be reflected in things like great customer service. I mean, we need to build those into KPIs. We actually need to build those into our ROI, ROI model. And in fact, Don has a financial calculation, which was, I think he presented at, uh, in Lisbon, perhaps, or somewhere, which was um, looking at how customer service can feed into your ROI model because it's a, a cost avoidance and a cost saving. Links to outputs are much less strong, clearly, than, than they are in mediated coverage, which is the traditional media model. So all of that can be difficult to track, clearly. But transparency and replicability still are fundamental because they're critical to create credibility amongst your clients and, and, uh, and the people who pay the bills. Demystifying black box solutions, I think we've had some conversations about that, and certainly the, uh, the content sourcing table, et cetera, is part of that process where you don't give away your secret source, which is essentially or should be about your insight, but you're clear about how you arrived at the data that drives that insight. Okay. We want clients to be able to make internal and external comparisons. What I mean by that is we need to make sure that our data is as rigorous as that is collected by our consumer insights colleagues or by any other function in the organization that is collecting data, including people like customer service, for instance, or CRM data. Um, if we are transparent and, and we are uh, adhering to certain basic research standards, we will improve quality. We will improve our own credibility as a function and as a, a, as a sector. And clearly, if we can demonstrate third-party research standards, we will be able to say to a client, we can eliminate bias from the uh, data. So I've talked a little bit about that before. So I'm going to say that that still should form, for pragmatic reasons in talking to our clients, this is still very important. It's not what happens in every instance, and the framework needs to reflect the fact that there are applications and business applications which do not always correspond to this model. But nonetheless, it's a good starting point, I think. Um, so this is the original matrix. Can I just have a hand show of people who are familiar with this? Or rather, the other way around, who isn't? Uh, great, okay. Uh, I'm afraid there's only one or two, so I'm going to assume that most people do know how this works. How many people have used it? Actually, that's interesting. A uh, few, <laughs> okay. <laughs> I might want to do a bit of research about why people aren't using it. Um, but essentially, the way the model works is, is to um, identify across the top the, the, the sales funnel stages. Um, and down the column, uh, down the rows on the left-hand side, um, three key areas. One is the activity that you've undertaken, the intermediary effect on journalists or bloggers or whatever it would be, and the target audience effect, all related to that bottom right-hand box, which is the organizational business result that you want to achieve. We did actually do some work on a social media grid. This is actually down mostly to, to Tim um, working on this. I can't remember when we did this. Is it a year ago? 18 months ago, a year and a half ago. Um, and basically what you, um, I haven't got a clip mic, so I have to stay around here, but um, what you will see here is a, a, a bunch of uh, activities on the top which are related to the sales funnel. So for awareness, we're talking about the kind of assets created, and, and you can assign a value to that, of course. Uh, blog posts that, uh, that are generated uh, internally by your, by your own people. Facebook posts that are generated by your own corporate uh, digital team, perhaps. Um, and a whole bunch of other things which are related to awareness driving activity. Okay? The intermediary effect would then be uh, in this first, um, uh, second row of the first column. Um, and these are just straw men. These are not designed to be the inclusive set 
of metrics that you would use in a social media framework. And I'm not proposing to walk all the way through this because it would be very boring. Um, this deck will be available, so you'll be able to, to grab that um, uh, as an exemplar if you want um, when you download the deck. But the key here is that we were able to create a grid that we thought worked for uh, active social media conversation development by clients. Okay. So if I move on, um, the challenges that we now face and where I think we need to look at that model again are uh, because we have certain key differences between social and traditional media. It's about dialogue, so you need to be able to track stuff that doesn't link back to activity. It's unmediated, so actually, do we need the intermediary layer at all? Does it mean anything anymore? Okay. It's self-activating, so again, links back to the idea that you can't track it back to, to a specific activity. It's also very fast, so your model needs to be able to kind of reflect changes that do occur, in fact, many times without your you're being able to control it or, or having initiated it even. Um, so you need to be able to, to reflect those changes. So the questions that we need to ask and that we need to get your input from uh, around now is the sales funnel appropriate, for instance. Are we doing something different with social media than, than working in, in the traditional marketing cycle? Is the intermediary row appropriate? And how could we best retain what's good from the original and bring it into the new? So I just want to, um, to run a, a case study based around the work that, um, that uh, UNICEF uh, engaged with Katie and her company to do. And I've just stolen these slides directly from, <laughs> from your deck, so attribution to Katie, really. So this is the basic deck. What's interesting here is that you see um, a different set of column headings. Awareness, engagement, knowledge, not... What? I don't know how to... Do that. Can you adjust the projector so that you can see the top? I don't have any control on that. Oh, sorry. It says <laughs> social community engagement, top left, awareness, engagement, knowledge of understanding of messages, and action. Yes, I'm sorry about that. Um, I hope the rows you can see. Uh, what's interesting here from, from, from what Katie did was that the bottom right-hand box is the first thing that's filled in. So the outcome is the desired effect of this grid. That's what we're trying to reach. Oh, I don't know how it builds. Okay. Now, what is interesting here for me is, aside from the detail of the, um, the, the, the activities that are uh, logged in engagement, knowledge and understanding of messages and action, is that the awareness column is not filled in. So you might say, oh, interesting. Why has Katie forgotten to fill in the awareness column? Well, she didn't. The reason she didn't was because the program was actually focused much more on the latter stages of the grid, the last three columns. However, what is interesting is that because awareness in, in some debates, and there's some conversation about whether this is strictly accurate or not, or 100% accurate, awareness could be seen as a necessary and sufficient condition for all of the other components to work anyway. Okay? So you can fill it in. Now, the beauty of the grid is that you can still retain your, um, your bottom right, which has now disappeared even further off the screen, so I apologize for that, um, your bottom right goal, but you can include what would be byproducts, in a sense, of the activity that you're, you're doing further up the grid. Does that make sense? So you can retrofit bits of the grid which will be derived from activities that are even further up the, the grid in, in the first instance. Um, you then get a, a much richer set of, of metrics um, to fill in the intermediary effect, and then what you can't see down the bottom, and I don't think even I can see that, uh, is target audience effects, which would be, uh, as you can see, certain quantifiable numbers. I'm not going to bother running through all of those for the sake of time. But you can link, you can still do what's important about the, the valid metrics framework. The single most important thing that you enable your clients to do is to link down through each column the key metrics that you need to drive specific outcomes. So the grid still does that for us, and that's the most critical thing that we can offer our clients as a way of making clear to them exactly how all of these things link together. So I did 
I did accept the chairman of this panel's view that we should be at 1.0. So this was the original grid that, uh, that Tim developed uh, in partnership with a, with a few other people um, about 18 months ago. It's uh, based around a new set of column headings, which is awareness, knowledge, consideration, preference, and action. So the point about the grids here that we want to, to bring across to you is that the grids are about enabling you to, in a sense, identify the relevant headings and labels that are appropriate to the particular kind of activity that you're working on with your clients. In this case, it's a, a different way of framing the purchase cycle. It's much more traditionally market research uh, focus, in a sense. Um, what, we, what we would like to do is to get to 1.9. We'd like to do it by October. And we'd like you to take that very straightforward grid, and we'd like you all to repopulate it. This is going to be an absolutely open, transparent, consultative exercise. We don't know the answer, because there may be multiple answers, and I don't think we can double guess what all of you in this room with all of your individual clients or your individual program needs would want to populate the grid with. So the idea is that we <clears throat> um, want to gain input from all of you and, and as broad a community as we can, and, and I'm hoping that we can do some work with the PRSA before the conference next year to gain insight from, from their members to understand how the grids should work related to the type of program that's being developed, to create, in a sense, something that Tim, I know, is very uh, keen to develop, which is a communications process workflow model that shows how the grid would work within the context of developing a strategy and building a program. I'd like it to be modular. I'd like it to be a kind of plug and play thing so that you'd actually be able to you know, specify some initial conditions. You'd be able to understand what components need to plug in and you end up with a grid that could effectively be kind of self-building, almost. I think that's going to maybe be a stretch too far. But we need you to give us the data, because we can't work that out unless we know exactly the kind of stuff that's being done, the kind of programs that are being built in reality, that we can retrofit into the, into the, uh, into the grids. So and in terms of aims, and I realize I'm on, 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 on amber, um, we will disseminate this deck actively to all AMEC members and everybody that's at this conference with a request for you to take, you know, 10 minutes, it doesn't take longer than 10 minutes, that's the beauty of the grid, to just fill in elements of the grid and the labels to accord to one of your programs. It doesn't matter what sort of program it is as long as you tell us what sort of program it is and we don't want to know who the client is. Um, we will create a webinar with the PRSA which will enable American PRSA members to input exactly the same kind of information so we hope we will get a very rich data bank in the end of, of material. We'll solicit examples for the grids until the end of September um, and I would hope that we could actually go to the PRSA a measurement day in October in San Francisco with some initial findings and some extensions to the grids that we've uh, discussed today. So uh, I'm going to stop there, but basically it, this is a call to you to help us help you by creating grids that will be relevant to the kind of specific applications that you're telling us you need. That's it. So, so do we have some questions for Mike? <clears throat> Hoping to escape. Jana Burke with Burrell Sluice. I, I have just a suggestion or something that I think would be very helpful is if we can get the grid filled in and then have that maybe with the glossary of terms by sure. region and geography, because I think Richard posted the slide earlier about all of the different social media networks Absolutely. in the different regions and territories. And I don't I think this is very kind of English speaking. Mm -hmm. uh, centric, and I just want to make sure that all of those other metrics that could be however they're engaging, whatever they're calling them, are taken into consideration because I think that's the only way that we're going to have continued credibility sure. across the medium, mm -hmm. the medium and globally to be able to be all inclusive. So if we can just include that, that would be great. One question for you, Mike. Um, when you look at the grid, and you know we're talking about this was done 18 months ago, everybody's yep. talking about social moving so quickly. 
what are the key takeaways and the key changes that you see should be implemented immediately? Um, I'm not sure that I'd be presumptive enough to say what I think should be the changes. I think um, certainly the, the column changes so that it doesn't stick so rigidly to the sales funnel or the sales cycle is one area that we, we clearly need to, to change. I think we need to take note of the kind of debating points that, that Don raised in his presentation. We need to be thinking about value and impact. Um, we need to be maybe recasting the idea of what counts as outputs and what counts as outcomes, possibly. Um, but I don't think we yet have a 100% cast iron view about how that would work. And, and in a sense, kind of sifting through raw data that we would get from this kind of consultative exercise might give us a much better handle on, on how that should work. Uh, because I think actually we'll probably end up, sadly, with, a, with two or three different grids. I don't think we'll have a clean solution. I mean, uh, Philip was talking about complexity, and I think the grids will need to reflect the fact that this is a complex new environment, sadly. So I don't think I can prejudge, but, but your points about uh, the grid needing to change are, are well taken, and it will do, because the social media landscape is so entirely different from the traditional media landscape. We've got the microphone for Philip, please. Hi, thanks, Mike. I, I was just wondering, because you know, we've touched on the issues around, or, or the benefits of research and planning. Yeah. Would there be any merit to including a column before we get to the, either the activity or the awareness stage that covers off pre-planning research, so you're actually entering the grid informed, knowledgeable, and make and you know make there's less assumptions around what awareness and activity could and should be. I guess the grid was yeah, it's a very good point. But I think the grid was designed, in a sense, actually to be the it, the, the grid is an enabler. It's a, it's a conversation starter. And and actually, what I think has happened in certain cases where I've talked to practitioners about the grid when I've been doing kind of evangelizing work and teaching work, is that. What it does when you get faced with the grid is it forces you into the conversation prior to the awareness grid. Then you come back to the grid and then you fill in the, all the rest of it. So um, we could either make it an explicit column, or I think what happens is that when you start talking, you get it anyway. But it, and it forces the client to start thinking in a very different way to the way that they would traditionally create an RFP, for instance. And that, that's one of the interesting side effects. I think anything that makes better RFPs would be <laughs> welcome. <laughs> I thought that might appeal to you. <laughs> better procurement, too, I might add to that, yeah. Philip. Is, <laughs> is there any other questions for Mike? Okay, so will you all please join me in thanking Mike very much.